Thank you all for your patience and your comments. Okay, item 186 uh, is to consider a request to sell a seven-foot strip of land on town-owned property off Loxley Road and to grant an easement in the same area. Yes, thank you. Uh, we all uh, have in our packets a memo from the town manager and several pieces of information uh, from uh, Ibis Corporation from several residents of the Stonegate uh, development <coughs> regarding this matter. Uh, the request is that the town sell seven feet of uh, land uh, to the slatteries and grant them an easement in order that they can build a driveway over a 45 foot piece of land that the town now owns. This land was given, given to the town of Cape Elizabeth by Stonegate Associates uh, with several stipulations. Uh, the property was to be preserved for outdoor recreation and education of the general public. Uh, no structures were to be built in that land. Uh, no alterations to the surface of the property are to be made. No commercial, residential, uh, activities shall be permitted. Uh, no motorized vehicles uh, of any sort shall be permitted on the property with certain exceptions. So the land was to remain exclusively for public purposes when it was given to the town of Cape Elizabeth. We do have representatives here of the Slatteries and uh, I'd like to ask them at this time to address the council. Thank you, Jane. My name is Dennis Slattery. This is my wife, Kathy. Uh, we live at 32 Old Fort Road. We've been residents of the town for two and a half years now. Uh, Mike McGovern suggested that I bring an attorney here tonight, and Tom Powers is, is with me. <coughs> if I can start to give you an idea of what's happened. I, last year, July of 86, I purchased a lot that was right next to my house. Uh, the reason I did that was because the builder who put my house up, who also purchased that lot, uh, came to me and asked me if I could help him out and buy it. I purchased the lot with the idea that I was also going to get a driveway easement, which would be located in adjacent property, which at the time was not owned by the town. Uh, now what I've, I've put together a quick little history because I want to give you a background and it's within this folder. And if you could look at it, what I've done is, if you look at the contents page, they're numbered 1 through 12. And what I've done is number 1 where I have Sherwood Forest Plan. If you could look to the top right hand corner, I have a 1 on the document to reference it. So what I'd like to first, the lot we're talking about is lot 20B which is on Loxley Road, which is adjacent to my property. And for item number one, the reason I chose this is I wanted to show that it was, it appears that it was, the lot was created as lot 20B uh, in April of 1979. This was a plan that uh, we're not really sure, but apparently it, uh, it didn't get proper approvals, but it, the lot itself was created by this in 1979. Item number two. Excuse me. Sure. You, um, you live on 20C. Where do you live? Yeah, well, if you, if, what we'll do is we'll clarify that now. If you can look to item number two. Yeah. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, this is, the, this is the plan itself, the blow up. And what we're addressing is this, this particular portion right here of the plan. Right. And you, which, where do you live? We live on lot 20C. You live on 20C. You and look you, at page two. And you bought 20B. And we purchased 20B. Mm -hmm. And where we're talking about the driveway easement, okay, what we've got is a blow up of this area. Mm -hmm. Here's where my house is. This is the lot I purchased. Let me say this. I lived in this house two years ago. I purchased this two and a half years ago, this house. Last year, 
year I purchased this lot from the builder. At the time I, I purchased this lot, I was assured I would receive an easement. See this ground right here? Across here. This is the ground that we're talking about that the town now owns. At the time I purchased the lot, this ground was owned by Sherwood Realty Trust. I've got some documents in here about that. There was a commitment from them, as well as from Ibis, to give me an easement for a driveway at that time. We've already got easements across this property for sewage and utilities already to service this lot and for servicing this lot. Uh, as we get into it, there's a sewer line that's, that's been brought in here and it's kept at the lot. Uh, when the builder built my house, he had intended to build a house here and he's back, he's put a whole load of fill in here already. So that's existing. This whole road was put in last year. Uh, there's a, a, a water flow or still in this area over here. And this road was put in to access that. What's happened is when it was put in, it was put in at a higher elevation in this property here, which is my lot. And right now the condition of my lot is such that this is higher. There's a lot of water collecting all along here. All these trees were cut and left all along here on the back of this property. The whole idea was there was going to be a house here, so there really wasn't concern over how it was treated. Uh, yeah, can I just ask one other sure. thing at this juncture? That other chunk that we see in there, that other smaller piece, that's what was given to the town? That, that, whole, given that entire piece that we're looking at? What, what was actually happened? This at one time, there were 16 acres, seven, 16 or seven, there were 17 acres total. Okay, this part of this package that we had here was a parcel on this plan. It was split up into lot 20C, lot 20B, and I think they call it parcel 5, which was a 16 acre piece of ground. Now, that 16 acres was, uh, was, was, uh, was part of Sherwood, Mr. Balfour owned it, put it into Sherwood Realty Trust. Then it was sold to Ibis as part of Stonegate, from how I understand it, and then Stonegate donated it to the town. I'll probably be referring back to that. Yeah. Item number three, I wanted to show that uh, when I purchased the lot, I had a, had a separate deed for the lot. Uh, and, it, and it's 20B, and if you, what I did was I highlighted certain things on these things also. And you can see that in there they, they make, make reference to a February 23rd, 1979. They reference the plan <laughs> that we have down here. Item number four, I've been receiving a tax bill for this property all along, and it's, it's assessed and, and it's been taxed as a building lot as long as I've owned it, and it's been assessed and taxed as a building lot for, by the person who owned it previous to me. That's 20B. Yes. yes. Now what happens is it's, it's got a different code here. You see UO 618C, that's the tax map. But it's, but when I say that, this, this is the tax bill for this lot. Okay, so it's, it's taxed as a building lot. Well, it's been that way all along. And it shows as a separate lot on the tax maps. How, how are you defining building lot? It's, you said it, you keep saying it's taxed as a building. Okay, it's got an assessed value of $24,800. Yeah, but I mean, you say a building lot. Are you making a distinction when you say that phrase building lot? Well, or you, you, mean, you mean it's being built it's yeah, being I purchased built it as a lot. lot and I don't have to sell it. The reason I purchased this was, I mentioned how someone, the other reason was, I lived here, this thing was up in the air, I wanted to make sure, you know, have, have control over who my neighbor would be. Okay. Item number five, I'd mentioned that there were commitments for, a, for an easement. Over this, over this particular ground for a driveway, there's a, there's a letter dated February 28th. It's, you know, it's Tom Powers from Sherwood 
Road East Trust. And it's confirming that, that they would get a driveway easement. Excuse me. This was prior to the time they gave the land to, to, to Cape Elizabeth. This is prior to the time they gave the ground to Cape Elizabeth. This was, and prior to my purchasing the property, this commitment was here. Now what happened was Sherwood really trust, then the land went from them to Ibis, which is item number six. Before we get to item number six, I, I just have a question about your, your driveway easement. Uh, it says that there's some sort of confirmation about an easement, but it doesn't become specific as to what sort of an easement. If you look under RE, where I highlighted, it says driveway easement. Can you see right here? Up at the top. Up at the top. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, could I ask a question? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Who are Seaborn Associates? Seaborn Associates is, is Tom Bowers' company. It's not a legal firm. Yes, it is. It is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Could I ask one other point of clarification sure. then? Is that lot big enough to build on lot B as it presently exists? I wasn't, I'm not clear. Okay. Within, within our present legal yeah. guidelines. Well, here's what we've done. Tom will get up and explain this further, but I don't know if you can see this. What we did was we put here these lines. These lines are showing what the uh, setback arrangements are in town ordinances. And then what we have is we have a, a large home drawn here to show that a large bigger the house that you want to put that would fit in the neighborhood wouldn't fit on this block. I feel like I just asked a sixty-four thousand dollar question, but go ahead. Twenty thousand square foot block. But but there's problems with setbacks, meaning because of the the need to put the driveway in. Oh, I mean, let me let me tell you. Okay. The reason, problem with the reason we need a driveway is because this is this is the this is really sloped here, and the only way to gain access to this lot is through this, through this road here. The road itself, what happens is the road is, is elevated going towards this point and then going down here. So this is the highest point on the road right here. So in order to get access to it, you know, you would, reasonable access would be through here. On the, the material that we got um, in our package, uh, there was some discussion about the frontage on, on Lockley Road, right. and we have it here in our little map, is 93.25 feet. And you mentioned the sewer easement, and the reason you want the seven feet to purchase it is to make up a hundred foot frontage, yes. which is part of our Sewer or yes. Which or? Zone. Zone. Okay. For sewer reasons, I believe. Because reason it's 100 foot is we were told for sewage. Okay. That's what, what I thought. What, what, what is it that you were saying? No. Uh, you don't know why the 7 feet and yes. 100. Uh, sure. I thought. The reason for the 7 feet is in an RC zone, this is it. <laughs> uh, you're required to have 20,000 square feet, which you would have. Mm -hmm. What you don't have is 100 feet. Even though it's grandfather. It has nothing to do with sewage. It's not grandfather because we're talking about a lot that is questionable. Questionable. Yes, it has been billed and taxed as a lot, but we tax all lands, whether they're billed or not. We don't always tax the full value. In this particular case, uh, as soon as it was brought up, there's not going to be taxed the full value. It's not taxed at billed or not. We don't use those words. The tax is a cost of land. But if Mr. Slattery doesn't get his seven feet, the lot is not buildable. Yeah, that's correct. So it isn't a buildable lot at this point? It has, it has some technical difficulties with being able to secure a building permit, and Mr. Slattery is on his way to the planning board this month to stop that process. But he has to acquire these additional seven feet at least to have that lot 20,000 square feet and 100 feet of frontage on the top row. Mm. Um, Jerry, while you're on your feet, is, is there um, 
I should know this, but I don't. Is there a variance in the ordinance, a hardship variance, that the 100 feet can be waived? Or? The variance requires uh, just that. You have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals and request that variance. Uh, as far as the hardship, that's something the Zoning Board would have to rule on. Uh, at this point, I think it's a legal question. That's correct. An alternative that does not receive the seven feet per pound is to seek a variance, but it's not a guarantee. It's a hardship candidate. It must not be something created by the applicant. And without prejudging anything, I suggest that may be a problem or if that's an anticipated problem because it's the applicant owned own both blocks. And I'm just pointing out that maybe um, that alternative was a secondary alternative. First alternative would be to seek the conveyance by the town of seven feet. There are three different issues. One is a subject to be created to require a pension work rule. The other one is seven feet to give the required feet funding. The third is a more discretionary request will the town convey an easement to allow him to reach the property? Uh, that has nothing to do with either the others. It's just that's because of the topography that's requested. You said convey an easement. We're talking about the fee simple, aren't we? I mean, we're talking about selling seven feet. Yeah. I'm saying there's three different issues. That is conveyance of fee interest in seven feet right. to get 100 feet front. Right. Okay. Separate yeah. and in addition, an easement to go up the so-called roadway access a lot to the side as opposed to accessing it directly in front mm -hmm. of lots of the road, which because of the drop off turned out to do. Did you no. say there was a third issue too? Yeah. yeah. Whatever you do tonight, we have given our opinion that they require planning board approval as a three lot subdivision. The lot you own the house on it, the lot we're talking about and the remaining land um, that created three lots in our opinion requires subdivision approval. We don't recognize this either as being grandfathered because it's not on a reported plan, nor that it predated the uh, frontage requirement because if it was a subdivision and it couldn't be sold without approval, then we don't recognize that it's been sold and therefore not created. In other words, you can't require town approval to do something that we can't say is grandfathered when it was done without the approval. If I could ask a common question, is, when you say it's not on a pre-recorded plan, is that because in 1979 this was done indirectly? When the lot was created, all this, my, my understanding is that in 1979, when Mr. Balfour did all this, it was quite common in mistakes like this happened. Go. I mean, this thing, something fell through the cracks in 1979. And my concern is that I'm paying, paying for a problem that happened in 1979. This, um, any subdivision back to September of 1970 had to obtain planning board approval, had to be on a plan that was signed by the planning board and recorded the registry. Uh, my understanding of the short cross plan is that it was prepared. Uh, but it was, and, and maybe he was, Mr. Balfour would have sold certain lots during the five year period, but uh, he could not sell lots on that subdivision plan, all the lots, or more than three in any five year period. And my understanding is further that he came back to the planning board two or three years ago for resubdivision when that was made crystal clear to him that he was not able to sell lots on an unreported plan. So he, he certainly knew that several years ago when he came back to read sub five short course. You can't sell on an unimportant plan. Oh, okay, no, I realize that, but I kind of get the plan that maybe a mistake. Okay, I, I don't want to get into all of the uh, legal problems involved with this slide. I, I, I'd like to really focus in on the issue that we have to deal with tonight, which is the whether we want to sell that seven foot uh, piece of property to the slatteries. Uh, and whether we want to grant an easement or not. I'd like to really concentrate on that and, and not deal with all of these okay. other side issues. If that's all right with everybody. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Well, Can I ask just one question for clarification to see if this might, it may not have led any light to this at all. But do you think the mere fact that the slatteries were butters?
could have been an easy way why this law was transferred because you wouldn't need a subdivision plan, you wouldn't need a recorded plan, would you to transfer it to an abutter? It could have been less than 20,000 square feet, it could have been more, it could have been less frontage, it could have been any sort of combination to an abutter that doesn't fall in the subdivision rules and regulations. Or am I wrong? Well, there are two different issues. As far as awarding subdivision approval, there is a means to do so with conveyances to abutters. If that abutter wants to build a house, it's to require to have the front of the house to make the lot. So um, the answer is yes, you can avoid subdivision approval if you do the sequence of conveyances correctly or in a manner to avoid subdivision approval. But no, you still have to get, uh, you still have to have the correct build lot. Right. The reason this could have occurred is because he was in the bottom, not just a third party walking in buying a piece of so-called jobable land. Bill, did you have a question? Yes. I'm not clear whether this was a lot or wasn't a lot. Uh, as I understand from Jerry, that it isn't a lot. A building lot. A buildable lot. Built a buildable lot. Built because it isn't valuable as a building lot. Is that correct? It, uh, excuse me, I was... No, okay, let me see if I can clarify. It was divided by whatever means some years ago, by whatever means, meaning there might be a legal problem. As the assessor, we look at all transfers of land, whether they're right size, oversized, it doesn't really matter. In this case, we had a 20,000 square foot lot that was a conveyance indeed. We had fixed the value to it, an appropriate value, because we feel it has a problem with zoning. It has a problem with zoning, which means it would be difficult to get a building permit on this very lot if you apply for one, because you do not have a feet front. Okay, so th that part it's a lot. It's a lot that has a problem. That has a problem. Uh, where the owner owns both of them, and I understand, I picture the lot correctly. It's the photography that is the problem as far as you coming in on your other lot to get your seven feet. Is that correct? Right? Yes. Your present lot. You can't move that line over enough to get your 100 feet. Is that what you're saying? Well, if I could, I would. Can I do that, Eric? Can you take some land from Route 20C to make up to get to his 100 feet? As long as he doesn't uh, lower the front of his own lot. All right. I mean, we're zoning, just, we're just no, but zoning has been put in place for various, for a good reason. If we all want lots to conform, if you don't have 20,000 square feet in today's standard, or 100 feet of frontage, you do not have a buildable lot in I, I understand that. And that's what you have before you, is we have one lot that was grandfathered and one that may not be. So, if I may continue that. The present lot that he lives on and has his present house, 85, Right. Front 85 foot frontage. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. So therefore, you're saying, and he's there now, he can't take that lot and take seven feet from it. That's correct. Why? Because, Mr. George, his lot is a non conforming lot. The one with the building on it is a legal lot. He did obtain a building permit and he built a house upon it, or at least the person before it. That was a legally conforming law at the time. Since that time, we have changed or amended our zoning ordinance, so now we do require 100 feet of frontage in every instance. That public access waiver amendment that we had a few, uh, I think a month, uh, I'm sorry, a year ago, all of this came out of that. Now zoning requires 100 feet on a town except the road. Sure. I just want, when I purchased the lot, you didn't need 100 feet. But that ordinance came out after I purchased this lot. Is that correct, Jerry? I don't have the time uh, track in front of me, so I can't answer that. All I know is the first one, definitely, was a time period when it didn't require other people. I'm not sure about the second one. I'm, I'm, I'm confident that that ordinance happened after the time I purchased my lot. Yeah, I haven't seen the date, but I'm satisfied. Yeah, Phil. One more question. Yeah. Uh, just a statement to see if I'm correct. At the time that he built his other house, and is when you needed, is it 150, 100 feet through 
where the house was being built didn't need only 50 feet in, on the road. Is that correct? Uh, That's the way the previous one was. Well, if you need so many feet through where the house was being built, the and, and you could have a pie shaped piece of property as long as you set your house back far enough so you had so many feet through yep. where the house was being built. Is that Our correct? The street, yes. Yeah. And it could be just like a pie shaped thing, it'd be 50 feet out to the street. That's right. Okay. Now, at the time that he purchased this lot, the ordinance was <coughs> such at that time. It wasn't changed, was it? No, I was still dealing with that one. You're still dealing with that one. Therefore, because of the change, he can't build unless he's got 100 feet. Is that what you're telling me? Well, yes, but what's complicated about also, uh, Bill, is the fact that we do have a subdivision that does not have, as you see here before you on this uh, plan, uh, it's not recorded and it's not been signed by the planning board or approved, and that's also a problem. Okay, so what you're also telling me then, this is not a recorded plan, no. so if it's not a recorded plan, how do you bill as it with a tax bill separately? I would think that would be one parcel if it wasn't. I could take my field, draw lines across it, and not record it, and you would uh, tax me according to all the lines? Is that what you're telling me? Well, I, I think what I think would mean a tax issue to the building issue. If, if there is a tax problem, we could address that separately. We could do that very comfortably with the assessor in his office. Yeah. But here, before you tonight, is not a tax issue. It is a building issue. Well, it's I, a question of seven feet not being there. And lots that are not legally shown on the point. I think it's a tax issue to this point that if you're taxing that separately and it's not, as you just said, a recorded plan, so I don't understand how you do it. We to me, that's that. one parcel. Yeah. I think you have to remember, too, that the, the assessment, uh, uh, the assessing of, of parcels of land sometimes has to recognize that they may not be buildable. We have, over all of our uh, tax maps, many, many pieces of land that are too small to be built upon. They are still being taxed separately. We don't put them I together, Bill, unless the guy, the person will come in and say, I would like all of my land assessed into one tax bill so that you won't send me three pieces of paper. Technically, we will assess by the D division that we get. The transfers on these two parcels came in at separate times. So they're dated separately? Yes, they are. My, okay. my lot, by the way, is the land value on my lot is $31,000. And I and I guess Jerry's saying that all these other houses in the neighborhood are at least that. There aren't any near the land values are nowhere near $100,000. I'm saying, uh, Madam Chairman, this is not a tax issue. This is before you tonight. We have a proper procedure for tax payment process for the session review. I just don't see it as a tax issue. Okay. Let, let's get on then with uh, your presentation, Mr. Slatter. Okay. Uh, if I can, maybe if we can take them one at a time, if we can take the driveway easement. Okay. Uh, I showed two letters where there were commitments ahead of time that I would have that from the people who owned it before it was given to the town. The ground was transferred to the town very hurriedly. I was never informed that that, that ground was going to be given to the town, and I abut the ground with two lots. I had asked Mike about that, and he had told Mike McGovern, the town manager, I told him that I, if I would have known that the town, that that land was going to be given to the town, I would have got my easements because, and I've also talked to Mr. Taylor at Stonegate, and he and they basically said they forgot about it as far as the driveway easement. So I'm asking the town to honor that. Uh, the other reason I'm asking for it is to honor what? What, is, what is it? Well, these, if you look at items number, the two letters, there were commitments. They were supposed to give me an easement at that time. For they meaning the Ibis Corporation. Yes, I was but supposed not, the town, not the town itself. What happened was that that Ibis fa Ibis failed to give me an easement. They had committed to give it to me, but the transfer took place before it was done. I had, if I'd have known that the transfer was being done, I would have gone and secured that ahead of time. So I wouldn't be here today. As far as, you, you know, uh, 
reasons for the town to do it. At the same time, you know, for a driveway easement, there's a, what's happened with this area right here now is uh, you, would, you would read all the uh, reasons, things you can't do with this piece of ground. People, people now do drive back here and drink. Uh, that's been involved. There's been uh, teenagers who've been back here. They've been smoking, using drugs back here. That's been something that this, uh, the police have been called on. Uh, this is, you know, usually there's a lot of beer cans back in here. Uh, I feel that, you know, if we had a house here with, with the driveway here, that. Uh, that area would be better served. Uh, also, if you go through here, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a letter from Dr. Rand from the Conservation Commission. We went before them with this. They had, uh, they feel that, 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 that this area would be enhanced if a house was put here, as well as if the driveway was here. Due to the comedy of errors and condominiums, a landowner, what have you, I moved that we sell a seven feet, a seven foot strip of land to the slatter. Is there a second to that motion? Okay, that motion fails for lack of a second. Yes, sir. Just trying to straighten this out in my own mind, and, and perhaps it will wind up in a motion, but just to try to understand what's happened here. It would seem to me that, first of all, what's complicated the whole matter is the fact that the town keeps records of undivided parcels of land and separate tax records. You never like that. I've run into problems because of that. And I do think the town is, is opening itself up in a very scary way in representing that these through the tax process. And I know that's not an issue here tonight. It's been a problem that I've had to deal with in the past. It's not fair. Because people are really thinking they're buying separate pieces of land because they see them taxed separately, they see them referenced in deeds separately, and they only get caught when either the bank is doing a title search or the town is saying no. And then they have to go and dig up the records and prove that they, that they do or do not have a buildable lot. But the underlying question here for me tonight is whether or not the town was given a piece of land to trust in the public steam. Now we're asked to give up a piece of that. We've been asked before, and I'm the one that's fought it. We've been given land over the past, that land all of a sudden becomes valuable, and the town decides or the administration decides, she's got to sell it. We've had some requests. And I've fought that time and time again, depending upon how the town received it. If it's part of a subdivision plan given for the public, then it should always remain that way. And I think that's what it boils down to as far as me tonight, whether or not we should give one inch of that. It was given to the town, for the town's people to enjoy in whatever manner was seen necessary at the time. It was certainly necessary at the time, according to the Conservation Commission, the Planning Board, and the people who reviewed it. It was a long and intensive review. I don't know if this resolves your problem at this point, but I would think if you've been promised this and been promised that, and you bought a, a, a bill of goods based on promises, that a good attorney would be one to seek out and uh, perhaps uh, the legal remedy should come from some other group in the town council. So if that's getting into a motion, I would just, I guess, make a motion that we that we table this request indefinitely. Is there a second, second. to that motion? Second. Okay. Yes, Penny? Um, if in your scenario, you would get the seven feet that would allow a driveway there, which would then allow you to, to sell this piece of property. What is your intention for having people pass over that piece of property to the land? I mean, is that this easement, so therefore people are going to be able to just go over it and 
Mm -hmm. well, and if it was the guy who's going to have his driveway there, which he may or may not park his little vehicle that he collects leaves in. But at any rate, people can walk over to his driveway. That's the plan. Yes, well, if I... He can't park in it or anything there? Well, here's, here's, Whoever it is. Here's the point is, this, this piece of ground is 53 feet mm -hmm. wide. What we're asking is, uh, I went to the Conservation Commission on this, and and, uh, and I've also been to Mike McGovern, the there's a letter in there, and I just I basically said, tell me what you want, and we'll, and we'll do it. Uh, so what I suggested was that uh, Dr. Rand didn't want to do anything with this. What I initially suggested was that we make this 20 feet wide here, we make an inviting path. When this is fixed up, that this is also fixed up. This right now here, that's got some pictures there. Mm -hmm. A load of rocks and stuff that have been packed down, and grass seed was thrown on it. This is a higher level. It's not an attractive site right now. And when I called Dr. Rand initially, Dr. Rand told me that he said, "I want you to know that our business is not building; it's stopping building." <laughs> and he came out and visited the site, and after visiting the site, <laughs> so simply. He, he agreed with what we want to do here. And the, the, the minutes of the meeting are, are in your package, and also in your package is my letter, or Dr. Ann's letter to Mike McGovern, the town manager, supporting us. See, my, my position is, can I continue? Yeah, go ahead. My position sort of is, in this thing, is that a couple of things. I always put an enormous amount of weight what Dr. Rand says when he talks, when he speaks with his conservation hat. On. I mean, I really, because he really thoroughly looks into these things. So I consider that to be a very weighty item. I, I do agree with Councilor Tinsman that we have a piece of land entrusted to us as representatives of the citizens of the community of Cape Elizabeth, and that if we were to set precedents that we would say, but we can give this up and we can pass this on and change this, that that's a difficult precedence. I'm also a little confused that I understand that we, in, in a fell swoop, can straighten out this problem for you and solve all the problems. But I, I tend to agree with Councilor Tinsman that that the difficulty is in either Ibis or Balfour, and not necessarily in the community of Cape Elizabeth, although I see that we are that the group that can solve it in one way. So I, I really between a rock and a hard place here. Well, there, I, I can't. Oh, just another suggestion as far as the ground itself. How about possibly swapping? I could take some ground from here. If I could get the seven feet here, I could give the group down ground here, we could just swap so there would be a location change, but there would not be any net gain or loss. Yes, Nancy? Well, uh, what are you supposed to do when uh, when the warranty, which if I can find it, says you can't, you can't disturb it, you can't build on the, the, the deeded property, uh, if it's used exclusively for public purposes. I was down there today. I don't think it looks so bad. Um, I didn't see a single beer can. I see what your problem is with that lot. It's that very steep bank down in the road. Um, there must have been a similar problem uh, where the e easement is now. The Ibis land. It's a little wedge there. That must have been pretty steep too on yes. the blocks of the road. They did manage to uh, overcome that with Bill. And as I looked at your property, I wondered if you could not do the same thing or if you could ha use the lot that you're presently on for access to lot 20 B. I mean, that is doable. You know, anything is doable, but it doesn't seem to me that it's doable for us to fly in the face of what is public trust. I take that seriously. Oh, so, so do I. And we might be setting a precedent. I don't know if we have any other kinds of easement like that in Fort Williams or Alliance Field or the Poor Farm. I know we allow Ken Maxwell to plant corn on the poor farm, but we're not conveying eas easements or land to him. 
I do know I that. Don't, do, do we have any precedent for Excuse this me. kind of thing? Sorry. I, I just want to mention I already have easements across the property for sewer. For sewer? Yeah. Yes. For, yeah, but who, who gave you the easement? That was from... Uh, That's sure part of the agreement. Not the family, the family, not the family. Well, you're asking us, though, to uh, give up part of our public land. Yes. And I, I for one, am uh, very concerned about the, the people who live in Sherwood Forest who work so hard to maintain access to the property, to the trails and all. To me, building a driveway there over a large part of it is going to discourage people in the future after it's sold. and. Uh, several exchanges of property down the way from using that uh, that access piece. And I, I really am uh, concerned about your motion, Doug, in that I would like to, I'm not interested in selling this piece of property at any time, so I, I would rather t uh, act tonight to uh, discontinue, uh, or, or not take any action on it, rather than tabling it indefinitely and giving Mr. Slattery uh, an well, indication that we might at some time, some later date, want to reconsider this, because really I would like to take action on it tonight, and I don't think anything could convince me to sell that seven-foot piece of land. Okay, um, I, to yes, get back on my motion, the table definitely would be doing just that. If, it kills if, it. if you feel more, if you feel more comfortable having a well, that's the under, if that's the understanding, because I don't want to raise the table indefinitely. Well, well, in my opinion, it. means. Yeah. Well, anything can be taken off the table. Yeah, but if we do no way. action at all, it's killed. Let's ask but, the town. But you're saying, though, Jane, if you say that, he, he still has the right oh, to yeah. the zoning board. I'm just saying that board. I don't feel that the town should sell this piece of property, given the agreement that we, under which we accepted the gift from Stonegate, uh, that this was to ever remain public land. And I, I don't care whether it's seven inches or seven feet. I just cannot be convinced that we should sell that piece of land. It, Doug? Because I made the motion, talk, how does tabling indefinitely, I mean, does that kill it effectively or does that leave room to pull it off? Well, it leaves, it leaves no to take off the table sometimes if it's going to be voting by council members to do so. I think the way you said it, 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 it is wise to the applicant that it's it indefinitely a long, long time. Well, I thought of, I would withdraw that motion and make I'll it. I'll withdraw the second. Do you want to make another motion? I would make the motion that the town would not sell any of the land in question here. And what about I mean, the easement? However, or, or grant the easement. Can I just ask one thing on the easement? Yeah, well, second. Sorry. Okay, wait till, all right, we have a motion now and a second that this land not be sold and the easement not be granted. Yes. Yeah. What I, on the easement itself, <coughs> what, what I'm asking is that uh, Robert Taylor, who or I just belonged the ground before he gave it to the town, had committed to providing the easement. He's, he's mentioned in a letter that he forgot that he supports us getting that easement, that it was just something that was dropped. Uh, I spoke with Mike McGovern. Mike admits that the thing was done very quickly and that it was not told to the abutters. And that, you know, I mentioned to Mike that if I was aware of that, I would have had my easement for a driveway. Well, I think we are are aware that there were an unfortunate number of circumstances that adversely are affecting you at this point. but. I think the greater issue is what is the responsibility of the town council to land that has been given to them to ever remain as public property? Yes, Bill. I don't know as I'm 100% selling land that's given to the town, but here's a piece of land. If everything had gone according to the way it should have, you wouldn't have had it in the first place. So I see no harm of giving the seven feet up to go with that other lot. And uh, I think with somebody there, the place would be much better kept than the way it is now. And uh, therefore, I will vote against the motion. Okay, are there any other comments? 
Frank? Yes, I, I guess I would just say that I feel very badly that these promises were made to you by this by this gentleman and then written off as I forgot. You know, when they're obviously two major commitments that maybe it's hard for me to imagine that those kinds of things could slip the mind when I'm thinking about, you know, having discussed it with you, you've been in my office and now I'm thinking about giving away that same piece of land to the town. So I, I feel I feel that it's very unfortunate you were put in that awkward situation. But I feel the same way in terms of the covenants that we're entrusted with. We just have to live by them. It was given to us and it's too bad other promises were made about that land to someone else. So nothing personal, it's just the way I feel. Yeah. Any other discussion? Okay, we have a motion before us uh, to deny the request to sell the seven foot strip of land and the easement off Loxley Road. All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? All right, the motion carries time. Thank you for your presentation. I'm sure you'll pursue this in other avenues. Okay, item number 187 is to consider a report from the Ordinance Committee regarding subdivision regulations and take any necessary action. Uh, Frank uh, Latore, as chairman of the Ordinance Committee, uh, has a cast of uh, assistants here tonight to help him. This is this revisions of the subdivision ordinances has been a, has been a long-term project, and I'm, I'm sure you're happy to see it coming to the final stages, Frank. You're on. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I am I'm happy to to be here. And I would like to mention to people in the audience and people at home that this is the culmination of a, of a large effort that has gone on, and it's gone on not only with the ordinance committee, but it's gone on with the planning board, with the town manager, with the town attorney, the COG planners, and many others. The process of formulating these amendments, I want to also emphasize to the audience and to the counselors, has been an open one that's involved a lot of research, a lot of discussion by Tom Leahy, Alice Rand, Steve Butler, Mike McGovern. We've had two meetings with the, uh, two workshops with the town council. We've had numerous meetings of the ordinance committee, which has brought us to the, the juncture that we're at now. As you all are aware, as uh, chairman of the ordinance committee, I usually go by a point by point look at the amendments, but as you can tell, the magnitude of this particular number of, of amendments is absolutely impossible, being this, this thick for me to go through my normal uh, one by one accounting of it, even though I know you all, you all would love. Please don't. <laughs> oh, you rather would not. Okay. But I'm going to just summarize it anyway, and then Tom and Alice are going to have some discussion about it also. I'll summarize it by saying that these uh, proposed amendments to the Cape Elizabeth subdivision ordinances fall into four general categories. Number one is sharpening the purpose of the amendments, where we're setting the overall tone for uh, what the entire subdivision regs are all about. Number two, our other amendments clarify definitions, which, uh, such as the definition of cluster housing and other definitions. Three, our procedures were rewritten regarding the process of submittal, of review, and of approval of subdivisions, both major and minor. And fourth and finally, standards of subdivision designs were discussed. This falls into two categories. One is policy, and one is strictly uh, technical nature. The policy issues revolve around important things like uh, escrow account fee and, and uh, recreation or open space fee, the technical things regarding street design and street construction, you know, things that engineers uh, have, have uh, given us lead, leadway on. So that basically wraps up my basic overview of all these amendments. And we have here tonight Alice Rand, who's the chairperson of the planning board, who will tell more about the evolution of these recommendations. And then Tom Leahy, who's the town attorney, who will give more of the specifics regarding uh, specifics of the amendments. I would like to also close by saying I want to personally thank Alice very much for all the hard work and your planning board members. The citizens owe you a debt of gratitude. It's a, it's a long, uh, cumbersome sometimes task. It's taken years to, to bring us to this point. Thank you very much and the planning board members for all the work. So, Alice? <coughs> Thank you, Frank, and um, I don't think you want or need a long preamble as to why the uh, subdivision uh, ordinance was overhauled, but I would like to just talk briefly about its development since it is almost, it might be termed historical now since it started back in 1984, early 1984, and at that time uh, it began under the tutelage of uh, Bill Carroll, who was our then town planner, 
Uh, Bill left and we had a hiatus of about nine, nine months and then Dick Tinsman did ask uh, Steve Butler, Dan Boxer, Peter Ganser and myself to <coughs> look into this project in depth. Uh, we examined the subdivision ordinance is in similar towns, both in the state and outside of the state, uh, so that we would be able to compare what we were doing here in our own town with what might seem like desirable features in other towns. And I have to acknowledge right now that we uh, I did something which may have uh, precipitated a Democratic uh, candidate from withdrawing from the race in that we did plagiarize. Uh, however, uh, all to our benefit, I hope. <laughs> and uh, after we reviewed this in, in, in intensive fashion, Tom Leahy uh, put it into fine fine-tuned it with his uh, legalese and added some salient points himself. After about the 22nd revised document, uh, we submitted it to Frank Latore's uh, uh, committee, his town ordinance committee, for consideration. There are four uh, rather substantial changes that I would just like to touch on very briefly, and I know that Tom is going to be able to enlighten you all as to the meaning, but I, I think these were given a lot of thought and, uh, by the planning board, so I'd like to just touch on it. Foremost, we decided that it would be helpful to divide the uh, subdivisions into major and minor in the review process with the hope that minor proposals, five lots or less, might be able to speed through the process a little in a more swift fashion. This does not mean that we'd give it less meticulous review if there were circumstances in it that required more intensive review that the major subdivisions do, we would do that. Secondly, we inserted language with sunset provisions uh, in order to prevent a proposal from coming back and haunting us maybe seven or eight years later, which we have had happen to us. Uh, and this sometimes, some have hung on indeed that long. Thirdly, we added language which we hoped would help maintain scenic views, view corridors, significant natural features, and historic sites. These are identified uh, desirable features in our comprehensive plan, and they are features which we feel attract citizens to wanting to live in the town of Cape Elizabeth, so we feel this is a very important aspect. And finally, uh, as Frank mentioned, there has been an addition of an escrow account which allows the planning board to use independent reviewers for such items as traffic, reviewing traffic, or perhaps wetlands. This will give us a solid base, we feel, to deny or approve uh, subdivisions. Previously, we perhaps have been subjected to a little brainwashing by the experts of the developers, and we feel this is an important ad added resource to make sound judgments, not to rely on the goals perhaps of the fox, but perhaps uh, <laughs> the goals that are represented in the chicken poop. I want to thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Uh, Tom, do, do you have anything you want to add? I really don't think it'd be worthwhile to go through all the changes. Uh, they've been summarized. I won't. It's getting late. If anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Um, I think the uh, highlights of the changes have been mentioned tonight. There's also one other major one that was not mentioned, I believe, and that is the uh, proposed requirement that uh, for major subdivisions that there be a um, there's, there's now a provision that would allow uh, specifically allow the set aside of land for open space use or in the alternative a fee um, at the time the town council will have to take action on the new subdivision 
um, ordinance, it will have to adopt a fee schedule. Um, we've also recommended one change to the zoning ordinance if the subdivision ordinance has changed. It has to do with cluster developments. It's not a major thing. It's not a real danger thing that, it'll, that if it's not changed immediately, it'll cause a problem. I just want to bring to your attention that there's one minor change to the zoning ordinance, and there's two, one or two fee schedules that have to be adopted. Should be pretty much simultaneously with the uh, adoption of the subdivision ordinance. So if we set this for public hearing for next month and then want to act on it at that same meeting, we should have that fee schedule prepared. Is that possible to do um, by November? Well, I think what you have in your in packet is a, um, the, the, um, yeah, I, I think it is. I mean, I'm not sure who's going to come up with it. We have a, uh, as determined by the town council on a periodic basis, it's a reference for the uh, amount per acre as determined by the town council on a periodic basis. Perhaps you need your ordinance committee to recommend what that amount is on a per acre basis. I, I, I think Great. also, didn't, didn't Michael say that there were other fees maybe too that needed to be looked at and it was going to kind of be part of a kind of comprehensive look that he had at other fees as well? That seems to ring a bell at one of the meetings where he said, you know, there's other things the council has to act on in terms of fees and I want to try to put it all together. We can pass this language and then as soon as possible pass the fee schedule. But I know he had at least two or three others that were being discussed and that he wanted to kind of tidy up all at once. So. But we could still present that to you. I think the re that, that open space fee really should follow suit immediately mm -hmm. because um, it's referred to. Right. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Nancy, do you have a question for Tom? Uh, yeah. Uh, where did the $100 per lot or dwelling unit, the escrow fee, mm -hmm. come from? Where did we get the number? Yeah. That was from um, a model ordinance. There were two. Um, I think Brunswick, Falmouth, and also uh, I think it was uh, York County Regional Group had an amount, okay? <coughs> um, as I stand here, I can't remember which one had the 100. They varied a bit. 100 was one of the recommended model ordinances. Uh, that means a fee of $100 per unit to be used for the hiring of advisors to the planning board, if not used, to be repaid to the developer. It was from, but it was from a model ordinance, and I do know we checked with several other communities and came up with the hundred. Where does the model ordinance come from? There was one. It wasn't by the Greater Portland Council of Governments. There was another planning group, uh, a regional group, and it was referred to in an MMA publication. I know, and that's we had a copy of that. We drew from several sources. I think that's where it, okay. that's where it came from, or it was the Falmouth one, of, and Brunswick had it. I think there were three, two or three communities we looked at, and I just. I can find out for the public hearing, but I don't recall now which of the three it came from. Thank you. Okay, other questions or comments from council? Bill? I just have, I just have one comment, and uh, Tom, you can, you can sit down. <laughs> you probably know what it is, though. So. <laughs> it was discussed at the audits committee meeting, and I am very much opposed to it. And I don't think it's quite fair. Is this, uh, if a developer comes in and wants to give some land as far as recreational, uh, okay. I think the town has done well in the past. I think they've picked up quite a few parcels. But now they have in here, which I've uh, been opposed to right along, is a fee. If you don't want to give any land, you're going to pay a fee. And that is just a developer. You can take a track of land. And if you want to build a house now and then, you don't have to pay a fee. So it's only certain people that is going to build in Cape Elizabeth is going to pay a fee for recreational purposes if they don't want to give you some land. And I don't think that's quite right. I thought when you build a house in Cape Elizabeth or any other community that your taxes was going to take care of any recreational schools or anything. And uh, I understand now there's something else coming down the road, uh, impact fees. You're going to impact the community well. The way I remember Cape Elizabeth, there's quite a few people impacted Cape Elizabeth. <laughs> and maybe we should have started it back then. But those people there had to do it through their taxes as far as building schools and what have you. And I think that's the way it should continue. And when we vote on this at uh, the uh, public hearing, I will... Uh, 
have a statement and be opposed to that part of the ordinance. Thank you, Bill. Doug? That's uh, a few more steps, uh, Councilor Jordan, to affordable housing in Cape Elizabeth that we're all trying to work. Okay. The impact fees and the additional fees and the lot requirements and the size and the gifts and the open space and, and some of the other things that we need. When we discussed these in a workshop, I had some concerns about portions of the subdivision ordinance, and I'm not going to get into them tonight because that's more for the meeting when we have the public hearing. But I would like to make sure that sets of these subdivision ordinances go out to the Fox or to the developers and their, and their, and their, uh, <laughs> and their consultants. Because some developers have impacted Cape Elizabeth with some beautiful subdivisions. Some beautiful places to live. We all live in these places. We, have, we don't live in, in rundown, ratty neighborhoods that everyone would lead us to believe that the developers are ready to, to put in town. They do so because of the ordinances, but they also do so because it's their, it's their piece of art in a lot of ways. I mean, they make money on them, they want them well done, and they really, you know, are not always the, the villains as we, or some people pretend they are. But I would want to make sure that as many consulting firms and engineering firms and people that are involved with developing Cape Elizabeth and the surrounding community have the opportunity, even if we have to send it to them, to review this ordinance change. Because they're the ones that have to live with it. And they can certainly come up with some good suggestions if they just seem out of place. And uh, that's all I have to say. I'm sure these will be available for anyone who wants them question of whether they should be mailed to developers. There are not many right. professional consultants in this area that they couldn't be sent to. You, you want their input? I want them to come if they have any problems with this and, and speak at the public hearing. Well, we'll make it public, but it's certainly not our responsibility to inform possible developers looking for land of, I mean, it's I, I not. You're not that. sending it to a developer. What I'm saying is there are a few firms that present and develop the plans for developers. Land use consultants? Land use consultants is an example. I, I don't mean that. Literally. These people should be notified, and it doesn't cost much to send this to them. We send information out to other people that we want their reaction to. They are professionals, and they, can, they may not have any questions about things that would bother me. And if they didn't have the questions, then I wouldn't... I wouldn't uh, make a big deal out of it. But certainly, if we looked and found five or six different firms that presented developments in this town over the last five or six, seven, ten years, it's not too hard to send five or six packets out. Penny? Well, I think that's really a nice gesture. I clearly, I feel that we put our hands and we wrote this into our planning board, our town attorney to do the legal writing of it, and the COG planner, who's a professional planner. I, I really. I understand what you're saying is it'd be nice to have the input from people who work professionally with land development, but I, I wouldn't even know how you go, what happens if you select the three but you forgot five? I mean, I don't even want to try and develop the criteria as to who, who falls into this category that we should be sending things to. And I, I think I guess I'd just be opposed to saying that we need to send them to people. I, it, we should publicize it that they are here. We could make it available to anybody. Copy should be with the assessors or whatever office they should be at. But I don't think that we should start a practice of rewriting our ordinances and then trying to inform people who, who might need to use them sometime. I just yes. sit well. Frank? I guess I'd like to know what attempts were made to find any bicycle clubs in Cape Elizabeth to inform them of the fact that a major change was being made on the bike route. That, that, I know what you're saying, but it opens far too many doors. It opens doors on us being discriminatory that we did it to some and not to others. It's up to citizens, businessmen in the area to be aware, like every other citizen has to be aware. Sometimes it's hard to get information from this council, sometimes it's easy, but it's up to them to try to figure out how they can get information from the council to select a few. I, I can't endorse that idea. Anybody else? Yes, Phil? I don't, I don't think we should send to any, anyone. If anybody's interested in it, they and if they're really interested, they would get in touch with the town and come in and pick a copy up. I believe that some of those people out there would be helpful of how it would work. Now, you can sit here and put them together. Somebody else can come in and give you an idea and say, hey, that's not going to work. You ought to 
change the word, it wasn't up about the other night that we wanted to take a sentence out and you said, and our attorney said, hey, you can't do that, I need that when I go to court. So that's the type of input that I feel you need and it might be something in this ordinance that a developer says, hey, you can't do that. Nobody could come in here and build. If that's what you want, say so. Don't write an ordinance, just say we don't want anybody. This is what I'm trying to say. So I feel their input is good. Nancy. I would bet a chicken out of my chicken coop <laughs> that the developers know perfectly well what is going on. The minute they see a notice for a public hearing, they will be in here and they will be picking up uh, copies of, of these new subdivisions uh, or revised subdivision rights. I don't think there's any problem with that and I think that they will come with alacrity to the public hearing and let us know how they feel. And I think I know right now how they're going to feel <laughs> about the escrow fee. Uh, I, I think we can make a special request to Steve Campbell to uh, run an article uh, on these revisions. And uh, I, once the information gets out that uh, there will be a public hearing. I agree with Nancy that People who are concerned will be here. Let me just say yeah. one thing, and then I'll get off that particular subject. Okay. There are probably half a dozen engineering firms or consulting firms in this area that represent 90% of the subdivision plans. If you tell, if, if you publish in the newspaper that you're going to have a subdivision ordinance, major, major change, which is what we're talking about here. I mean, we're updating into the 1987s, 88s, and 90s here in a subdivision plan. If you merely put that in the paper and say there's going to be a, a public hearing on it, and I was a consultant, I wouldn't come out and say a word. But if I was sent an ordinance change and said, review it, we'd like your input, I'm going to come out and say something. I'm not going to come out and tell the town that I have to work with on my own initiative that you may have some problems. But if you ask me for comments, I'll come out and help you. That's my purpose of... of, of going through this process. Do what you wish. But I'm telling you, you're missing, you're missing the boat. Okay. Uh, does any, is anybody prepared to make a motion on item 187 at this time? Thanks. I would move that we uh, set the proposed amendments to the town of Cape Elizabeth subdivision ordinances as written here as in our, all of our packets to the November meeting for public hearing. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Yes, after the fact, it's a discussion. I think it was a typo on the, uh, uh, what came in at the end, not the ordinance itself, it's one page, one B, three, two, 16, one, 16, yeah, three, yes, one, two, two. Okay. Yeah, it should be Q. Oh, what is it? Mine says Q. 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 Mrs. Q. In the cover letter? Yeah. Yeah, so it says Q. 16 3 one Q. Okay, did that, did everybody vote on that? I'm sorry for that to count. Okay, that was unanimous. It was unanimous. Okay. okay. Item 188 is to consider a report from the Ordinance Committee regarding parking on Woodland Road near Mitchell Road. Frank? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, we recommend banning parking again. No, <laughs> we recommend. What are we doing? Now, we recommend banning park. Occasionally, there's even good reasons for it. How about banning parking? I know. I know. It's not that late. I won't make that recommendation. That's a one o'clock. Okay. Well, we recommend banning parking on the, from the corner of Mitchell and Woodland, a thousand feet easterly on either side. And the reason is, if any of you go by there for a site inspection, you'll clearly see that it's in front of the apartments, the apartment complex there. The road is very narrow. And there's a cur not only is it narrow, but it curves, meaning that as people are pulling out of the apartments, if you take a right and you have to go around a parked car, you're going to be pretty much coming into head-on traffic. So given the fact of the volume of traffic, how narrow the road is, and the fact that there is ample parking supplied within the apartment complex, we felt that banning parking on both sides from the corner a thousand feet down is, is definitely in the public safety uh, area for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth and would be a good thing. Thus, we recommend uh, banning parking in that area and recommend accepting this ordinance amendment we have in front of you. Second. Uh, See how easy they can be for sometimes? When it, it's good when things come at the, uh, We have had some accidents 
there recently, and I wondered if the chief would maybe uh, speak to us on that public safety issue. Uh, pretty much as, as read, uh, we have had some accidents there as a result of vehicles that are parked in the uh, I think historically they get used to that fact, so cars could move in very easily and park the back and just using the road. Uh, matter of fact, the last accident involved the town vehicle, which was an important situation. Um, but I think that those problems are going to continue once, once we do that. And I don't think it will certainly adversely impact that area to uh, do that. We're certainly more access there in California. Nancy. I was just going to say uh, to my chairman, Frank, as a member of the Ordinance Committee, uh, as a good member of the Ordinance mm -hmm. Committee, I swung by there today, and there were two or three cars parked on the street. Mm -hmm. oh, I, I didn't run into either one. Did you make a citizen's <laughs> arrest? Someone will use that instead of using the parking lot because it's handy for them to run right in the house. Yeah, there's plenty of parking that's been thrown to our Move the question. Okay. All right. Uh, the question has been moved. All those in favor of the ban? Any opposed? That one passes unanimously. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes? We're supposed to be uh, putting this out for the public hearing, public not hearing. voting on it. That's right. Yeah, actually, we post the public hearing for the November meeting. Right. What happened to the people? What happened to the people who made their motion in the second? Well, the motion was right. uh, so was not really uh, right. So they should so withdraw that. Withdraw. Motion. Okay. Okay. I move we set it to public. Didn't Somebody I just. I just did it. Oh, okay. Fine. Second. No, we, we actually, all we did was move the question. That's right. We? Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. We unanimously, unanimously move the question. Now we will vote on setting this for public hearing on November 9th. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. yep. All those in favor? Aye. That's also unanimous. Seven three. Yes. And we certainly want to Good invite seven. Tom and Alice back after doing such a stellar job to the November meeting, too. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thank yeah. you all for coming. All right, item 189 is to consider approving the warrants for the November state referendum and bond issues and for the local charter revision referendum. Is there a second? Aye. Okay, uh, before we vote on it, uh, there is a town newsletter coming out, uh, Michael's newsletter coming out, which uh, highlights the fact that we will be at a new uh, voting place at the high school, uh, highlights the recommendations of the Charter Review Committee, uh, and uh, we will be sending out a notice to every voter uh, about the change in the voting place. And Steve Campbell's also going to do an article on the Charter Revision. Uh, all right, all those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, I'd also like to at this time remind people that uh, the local election this year will be held at, on December 7th and uh, that uh, nom nomination papers are available in the town hall office for anyone uh, interested in running for election. Okay, item 190 is to consider approving a request from the Portland Water District to install a water main in Sawyer Road. So moved. Sawyer. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. All right, that motion carries five, uh, five to nine. One member absent. <laughs> Item 191 is to consider a report from the town manager regarding hepatitis B shots for public safety personnel and take any necessary action. We have a uh, report from the town manager on uh, a request from employees who are working in the rescue unit, fire department, and police department to uh, allow them to have these hepatitis B shots. The reason it wasn't in uh, our budget is that uh, the problem was not foreseen, I, I understand, at the time. Uh, Dr. Pickus, Owen Pickus, uh, spoke to the employees uh, several weeks ago and brought the issue uh, to their attention. The shots can cost up to $150. I guess it's a series of shots that have to uh, be given. 
Uh, Clark, however, is working on a, a joint services bid. Frank, you may be aware of that. And uh, I think they're going to come in quite a bit below $150, it looks like. Uh, these shots would be optional. Nobody would be forced to take them, but they would be available if we, uh, if, if we act on the manager's recommendation. Uh, the manager did want me to remind all of you that we do have $20,000 left in the town council contingency fund if we are interested in doing it. Any questions or comments? Yes, Doug. I just have one question. Uh, and just for the record, I do consider this to be one of those items that I will go for the expenditures in my right of the surface account, so I will be voting for it. But is this going to be a synthetic shot or is this going to be blood? Okay. Other questions or comments? So, Dave, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, I'm only going to add about uh, not the company including the budget we as a result of the aid's concern. And I asked Dr. Curtis down, and one of the areas that he talked about further was the uh, area of the hepatitis shots and the availability of them. They've just recently, within the last year, I understand, developed a synthetic vaccine. Uh, what comes with him a little bit earlier was that they used to be. Uh, uh, a human vaccine that they use, and they were concerned that that might even promote uh, the disease. So since that time, they have developed a uh, synthetic vaccine, which is equally effective. So that's what we would use. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or uh, comments from Councilor Bill? I'll move that we authorize the manager to take $6,500 from the town. Up to? Up to, excuse me, $6,500 from the contingency for hepatitis shots. Uh, the rescue fire and police personnel. Okay. Any further discussion? I would, yes, sir. I would just hope that if he runs out of money and needs it for these key personnel for public safety, that he come back and just ask us, as far as I'm concerned. I but think I he would. I think okay, I hope so, that it's not going to be limited. I hope that he knows that he has that answer. Okay, all those in favor? Oh, geez. I'm sorry, Nancy. No, no, no. no. All right, all those in favor of the motion. The motion carries five to nothing. Okay, the last regular item on our agenda, and are you two gentlemen here? You must be here for this last item. Uh, is to consider a request from the Great Cumberland Realty Trust for a zone change adjacent to the Inn by the Sea. Welcome. Thank you. Do you have a copy of the proposed zone change change of way? Yes, uh, good evening. My name is David Jones. I'm an attorney representing Great Cumberland Realty Trust. Uh, Steve the Fox Moore from Land Use Consultants uh, is with me, also representing uh, Great Cumberland Realty Trust. Uh, we have submitted a request to extend the no parking zone in front of the Clark property by zoning it uh, to business from its current residential use. The, I believe you're all familiar uh, with the site. Um, at the time that the uh, zoning board and planning board approved the uh, plans for the present uh, uh, in by the sea, they imposed restrictions which prohibited use of the facilities by members of the general public. And the primary reason behind that, if not the sole reason, was that the site uh, was not adequate to service the parking that would be required and to uh, uh, contain the subsurface waste disposal system that would be required uh, to open the facility uh, to use by members of the public. So the permits under which the inn is operating uh, states that the facilities of the inn will be used only by registered guests. Uh, Great Cumberland Realty Trust, which owns the inn, has acquired ownership of the adjacent parcel of land, the William Clark property, and uh, uh, would like to expand the business B zone to allow that site to be incorporated into the in project. We recognize that this process is a somewhat lengthy one in that after the zone change takes place, the new plans will require conditional use approval of the zoning board as well as a site plan approval of the planning board so that we're just initiating a fairly lengthy process. Uh, we hope 
uh, based upon some indication that we've had from many members of the town that they would like to see the facility open to the public, uh, that the response to this will be generally favorable and we hope that the, that the uh, process will move along uh, uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, we were notified we were somewhat unexpectedly that we were on the agenda for tonight. Uh, we had expected to go first to the planning board for its recommendations. Uh, and so hadn't really prepared a formal proposal or, or formal presentation. Uh, but if you'd like to have uh, Steve show you the plan and uh, explain how the parcel would be incorporated into the site and then respond to any questions, we'd be happy to. I think the reason that you're on the agenda tonight is so that you can get the process going because uh, right. the proper procedure would be for us to, for you to make the request for the zoning change and then we refer it to the planning board so then it would come back to us uh, at some later date probably but if, if people are, would like to have a presentation tonight uh, I think a, a quick one would be good just yeah. like, let me see what yeah. the drawings are five minutes no. he'd be disappointed <laughs> <laughs> after waiting all this time we really we are some there. of the public who are, who are very interested in this because we would like to over for dinner. <laughs> sure. I, for one, prefer to think of consultants as the hen house rather than <laughs> the fox. I, I but I guess we'll save that discussion for another day. Those of you who are familiar with the facility, if I can just start while I hang these drawings up. familiar with the existing inn. <coughs> the existing inn facility is shown on this drawing right in here. The existing parcel that went through the planning process in town is this parcel here indicated by the dark line. It extends down in a shape that comes down behind the Clark parcel. This is about three and a quarter acres, and immediately abuts this parcel formerly owned by Mr. Clark. This dark line that separates the two parcels is on there to indicate where that existing zone line occurs between business A, excuse me, business B, which is the existing parcel that the inn by the sea is located upon, and residential A, which is located to the side and is comprised of just a little over 30,000 square feet. What is contemplated, as David mentioned, is opening up this restaurant to the public. The way we can do that is accommodate that additional parking that's required for that facility on this adjacent parcel. Part of this same plan is to bring in a six-unit building. In the process of building this and operating through the first year, the owner has found that these in units in here in the main building are the preferable units in terms of the weekly rentals and wants to expand that smaller, lower cost unit on a, on a uh, overnight basis into this area. So what's proposed is a single building of the same size as the cottages that are out there now that's shown in the dark area within this new zone and then expanded parking to serve that restaurant facility. The request then is to move that zone line over and incorporate this parcel into this parcel that exists as business B. That movement is just about 125 feet. It's 121 feet at the front, 127 feet at the rear. So the request is to incorporate this into that business B zone and then allow those uses that I just outlined to occur in there. That is in essence what is proposed as a site plan. I can answer any questions on that in any detail. This so the property work. lines and the lines regarding uh, separation from business to residential are, are co coincide. They are one <coughs> uh, on your diagram. What, 
right now the zone line, existing zone line, comes down through the parcel and over. What is being requested is that those be put coincidental. But I mean, where, where is his line, his property line on the left hand side there? It's the same as that other one? Yeah, okay. So there, that's what I meant there. That's the former property line. Right. This parcel has been purchased by Great Cumberland Realty Trust. Now the zone line is cutting through that common parcel. Another question. What uh, criteria are you going to use? I was surprised to see the subsurface disposal as a part of this. I mean, I, I can understand about the parking and, and adding on additional units, but what do you do you have a feel right now for what criteria you're going to be used in terms of how much subsurface disposal that you're going to add on? Yes, we do know exactly how much we're adding on. As a part of the original approvals, the restaurant facility, which was in the inn, was designed to serve guests only. As part of the design flowage, the restaurant flows were not calculated as a part of that because of the way that Health and Human Services structures their calculations of sewage flows and because of what we as designers and civil engineers work with for design calculations for flows. As a result of opening up the restaurant to public use and these additional six units, those generate what we project as our additional flows. That's why we look to locating a new small subsurface disposal field in this area approximately right where I'm pointing my finger, which would be just behind the existing Clark residence, which is intended to be removed. So, so it's going to Yeah, that's what you just answered that. But, but what I'm saying is all you're calculating, or what I'm trying to find out is all you're calculating is based on additional restaurant usage and limited uh, the, the usage of the other additional units. So that is so there's no factor thrown in regarding any of the other presently existing units. There's no factor in that in increasing the subsurface disposal. It's strictly based on restaurant and the new units calculated at the same rate that the old units are now calculated at. That is correct. The existing subsurface disposal field, which is in here, is designed to serve the existing inn and cottages. So this would be an expansion just to serve that facility and the six units. Another question, comment. Yes, sir. I'd just like to refer this uh, to the planning board. Is there a second? A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Penny, did you vote? Yes. Okay. Unanimous. Thank you, council Thank members. You. Thank you for your presentation. Madam Chairman, can I ask yeah. uh, a point that intrigues me a little bit about the process of this, of, of what we just voted on and mm -hmm. did? And maybe, I don't know, maybe Michael would answer it if he was here or something. But why are we, why is the process designed that we're asked to send that? If we're not really going to study the issue, if we're not going to make any kind of policy decisions, why are we asked to make this almost uh, because automatic? According to our audiences, uh, if a citizen or a group wants to initiate a zoning change, they have to first come up and we kind of do I guess I don't understand that. I don't understand that process. Well, Maybe that's another job we could give the audience. Okay, I will. I, I, think, I think it's either we're going to study it and look at it and really get into some questions and, and be a part of it, or let's eliminate us from the process. I feel awkward at, at these. So. Well, remember, we, we've had another one in the, this year. Uh, come to us from the uh, and I voted, I voted Atlantic Atlantic on that because it's, I couldn't get a guarantee that the Conservation Commission would, but yeah. whatever. I just okay. think they're silly, but I'll <laughs> talk about it later. All right. Uh, does any any council have anything else they want to bring up tonight before we adjourn? Okay. If not, a motion to adjourn is in order. Second. Second. All those in favor? Okay, the uh, October meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council is now adjourned. I have my nomination papers here. Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit.